Steve Mann is the keynote uh, speaker this morning, and it is my honor to introduce him, the father of wearable computing, Steve Mann. Hello. Pete, it's a, it's a real honor to speak here, and uh, I really want to thank you and uh, Ori Inbar for, for bringing me here and having this wonderful opportunity to present and describe a project that I call Glass Eyes. Uh, if you look into my right eye, it sort of looks like I have a glass eye because there's a 45-degree beam splitter here that diverts eyeward bound rays of light into this camera system through the wearable computer and then into the rendering engine on the other side. So, um, you know, over the last 30 years or so, people refer to this as the glass eye or the digital eyeglass. And the... Um, what my original inspiration for building this is, my grandfather taught me to weld when I was four years old. And, uh, and so I started, I learned stick welding then. Actually, I taught both my daughters how to weld by the time they turned four as well. They could both TIG weld aluminum as they've been playing violin since around age two or three, so they get kind of used to the steady hand. And so one of the thing, things that I notice is when you're looking at the welding world, you look through a glass to help see better. And you have this dark glass, and you see everything through this dark glass, and it's what I call diminished reality. Um, because the arc is so overwhelming that instead of augmenting it, what you want to do is diminish it, bring it down to a level where you can see it. Now, the problem with this diminished reality is it's kind of scary f as a four-year-old to go inside this dark thing where you can only see this little pinprick of light and the whole world is dark. So I thought, well, I had this idea of digital eyeglass which is take this glass that we look through to see, normally we seen through the glass darkly when you're welding, and I wanted to say see seen through the glass clearly to have a magic glass that would just augment the dark areas of the image and diminish the bright areas of the image, hence something I called augmediated reality, which is to augment and diminish the reality and modify the reality. Here's a little video that kind of... This video introduces a new way of seeing the quantigraphic camera. This camera captures a visual dynamic range of 100 million to one. The goal is to capture, transmit, or share welding video of molten metal, electric arc, and surrounding material all very clearly. So this is an ITAP device. It causes the eyes themselves to function as if they were both cameras and displays in effect, in the sense that it captures eyeward bound rays of light and those rays of light are resynthesized in laser light to draw into the eye. And so, as a result, it creates a mediated reality environment, or what we call a visual filter, which is a proper superset of augmented reality. And this allows us not only to overlay information, but also to modify what's seen and to modulate light that's coming in. And in this sense, it's perfect for welding applications where we'd like to see a dynamic range of a couple hundred million to one, and so we can use this high dynamic range imaging in real time to see a stereo 3D image of... I'll skip ahead. Let's come back here. So a normal camera can't see anything in that dynamic range. But what I invented here is something called HDR, high dynamic range, where I capture differently exposed images of the same subject matter and computationally combine them together. So the, the eyeglasses Here's an example from a quantigraphic camera mounted in a welding booth to show a group of students how to weld a hydrolophone pipe. Notice how we clearly see the weldcraft cup, the tungsten electrode, including the tip, and the filler rod as well as the glow of the molten metal. So you can see there's four images now there uh, in the upper left, dark, medium, dark, medium, light, and light, and so my vision system grabs differently exposed images in rapid succession and stitches them together in real time to see a dynamic range of more than 100 million to one. Uh, I can also look into the car headlights of a car in a dark alley and see the license plate number and the face of the driver clearly. I was the victim of a hit and run at one point in time, and the, the perpetrator picked the wrong person to hit and run because <laughs> I could remember what the driver looked like and I could give the police a good memory of what the driver looked like. I have the quantigraphic camera on my helmet so that I can see the welding process on my head-up display. The special camera can be mounted on or in a welding helmet or on a tripod or on a special stand in the welding booth or it can be handheld by an assistant. 
Notice how we see the details in the hydrolophone pipe, such as the serial numbers on the pipe, at the same time as we can see the glow of the tungsten electrode and the surrounding weld puddle formation. Each hydrolophone pipe has a unique serial number. You can even see the details of the smoke emerging from the mouth of the hydrolophone bulb. This is all running in real time. So this is what I see through the glass. When I look through the, the glass, the welding glass, I see this computer-generated world that guides the user how the arc length is in, in real time, provides information. This is not merely augmented reality, this is augmediated reality, meaning it's to augment, diminish, and otherwise modify our perception of reality so that we can actually see better. It's not just confusing gimmicky overlays, but it's actually helping people see better. And that's the fundamental purpose of eyeglass. The purpose of this glass was to help people see better primarily, and then these other overlays and so on are added features, but they're not at the expense of the fundamental reason for glasses to see better. It's like a, a wrist, if a wristwatch can't tell time, what good is it? If a glass can't help you see better, what good is it? This is some pictures of what the glass looks like. So it looks the glass eye effect. It looks like my eyes are made of glass there because you're seeing the, the eye itself is the camera. The eye tap device causes the eye itself to be the camera. There's some better shot of it there. There's a recent article that appeared, Quantographic Camera Promises HDR Eyesight from Father of AR in, 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 published in Slash Gear um, that sort of shows this work, which is about 35 years old now, but it's caught recent attention and recent interest. So this is kind of, now I use this in everyday life to help me see better. And so um, in years gone by, I had the communications, a separate transmitting and receiving antenna here to, to send and receive simultaneously video graphics and text. Uh, this is like 35 years ago in the 1970s when I did this. And uh, so it's shared augmented reality. There's my 1995 passport. Um, with the system. This, this is a system for everyday life. It's part of me. It's not kind of an afterthought or a, a sort of thing. It's, it's kind of this idea. Um, in, the, in the media, I guess the newspapers referred to me as the world's first cyborg, but I don't kind of like the word cyborg. I don't quite know what it means. I think everybody's a cyborg, really, because we all wear shoes and clothing and we see the, experience the world in an indirect fashion. So AR vision in the wild meant 30 years ago I had to bring this apparatus with me, separate transmitting and receiving antennas. An AR vision system consists of wear cam, wear comp, and wear disp, a wearable camera feeding into a wearable computer, feeding into a wearable display. Uh, so it modifies what we see. That's augmented reality. It has a camera, processor, and display. And this is uh, much more powerful than augmented reality. Uh, or has potential to be. This meant that I had to carry with me everything infrastructure because there's no wireless communications. I also had WearCom, which is wearable communications. So I had to carry those. So whenever I traveled, I had to get the radio license applied for in whatever city I was going to and get the country and, and bring the antenna and put it on the roof of the tallest building. And there's my equipment that I had to carry with me and set up in the elevator machine room up on the roof to receive the and give my internet connectivity. It was easier 30 years ago to get internet connectivity because I don't seem to be able to get internet connectivity anymore because the hotel internet doesn't work very well. <laughs> and it's like, you know, they say we could never put a man on the moon now because, or a woman or person on the moon now because um, we don't, it isn't, it's been done already and it isn't, what's the glory in it? Because it's just like, you know, now we can't get an internet connection because it's, Hard to do it reliably. It was fun back then. It was worth the effort. So I'm up on the roof of the building here. This is the roof of the tallest building in the city where I'm putting an antenna, ice pole 440, up on the roof there. The eyeglass that I'm wearing there just looks like ordinary eyeglasses. This is by about the mid-90s. I had it looking just like ordinary eyeglasses. Nothing special, nothing strange. It just people wouldn't even know I was wearing it. I had three tests for AR in the wild. One is the casino test. So I wore this to a gambling casino to make sure that it looked normal enough that they didn't complain. 
which was successful. And then the other is the swim test, which is a test of ruggedization. You hop into the ocean wearing it to make sure that it can take whatever your body can take. And then um, there's also the efficacy test to make sure it actually helps you see better. So this, uh, um, when I was at MIT back in the 90s with this eyeglass, a fellow named Mark Spitzer came to visit with me and he was interested in, he got interested in that. And, he uh, said, hey, this would be interesting. So he ended up making this kind of idea of glass that help, looks fairly normal. Um, this, there's an interesting history of AR vision that Pete Wassell and, uh, and, and I are organizing together. And Ryan Jansen here is working with us, <coughs> with us on it. You want to stand up, Ryan? You can show yourself as the curator. Um, <clears throat> and, and so this exhibit is in room 201 during the break times. It gives you this kind of, you can see back this chronology. We got some good documentation, photographs of the exhibit. Um, this, historically, this is kind of an interesting little historical an anecdote. I brought this invention down to MIT. So it's something I invented in my childhood, but then I brought it with me when I went down to MIT. And so this is the director of the MIT Media Lab, Nicholas Negroponte, in his own words, describing the founding of the MIT Wearable Computing Project. Totally different. It's, 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 it's a very, very different time for us. Steve Mann was uh, building wearable computers in high school. And I think it's it's perfectly good example that here's a young man that brought with him an idea that was very much on the lunatic fringe was very much something that people thought, well, this is kind of weird and it doesn't really make sense. And when he arrived here, a lot of people sort of said, wow, this is very interesting, and faculty became more interested, and he, and it's a, I think it's probably one of the best examples we have of where somebody brought with them an extraordinarily interesting seed, and then it sort of, you know, it grew, and there are many people now, so-called cyborgs in the media lab, and uh, people working on wearable computers all over the place. What I've got is I've got a computer screen in my glasses. I've been experimenting with uh, something, uh, what you might call um, wearable computing or pers you know, personal computing. The real thing here is that it replaces a lot of the normal things that we carry, such as camcorder, uh, still camera, um, Walkman, um, pager, cell phone, all of those personal electronics items are subsumed into a single apparatus because, you know, I have a camera built into the glasses so that as I look around, the algorithm that I've developed seamlessly stitches multiple pictures together and makes them into an image composite, something I call painting with looks. So that uh, painting with looks system built into ordinary eyeglasses that look no different than any other eyeglasses uh, allowed me to walk around and build essentially what was like Google Maps is today. Everywhere I walked, I would build maps of wherever I was, painting with looks using video orbits. So the whole world around me was mapped in real time in an environment map that others could navigate and share in a shared, augmented reality space. And so it's interesting because this was in... in, uh, in, in in the, 19, in, the, in the early 90s, a lot of this idea of a single unified device that is a telephone and a, and a communications and so on device. Um, so where cam is vision-based AR. A mediated reality com comprises three things, wearable camera, or wear cam, wearable computer, wear com wearable display, wear disp. So those three things come together. Now, wear comp and wear disp is a well-researched field. A lot of people saw this and companies like Reflection Technologies saw, you know, I, I was in touch with them and they saw what I was doing there and they thought, hey, that's really interesting. We can commercialize that. So they made this display um, that just displayed text. And I thought, you know, come on, guys, you, I, I, it wasn't just text. I want to see pictures too and, and have a camera in there. So the idea of having a camera in there is, is part of the vision of being able to see. But the cameras are often added in as an afterthought. You know, uh, um, when, the, when Micro Optical got bought up by my view, I said, you know, it's been 10 years and you guys still don't have a camera in there. I was talking to Mark Spitzer, you know. And so, uh, so I got the my view and I chopped it in half and I, we milled it out on the milling machine and we put a camera in there looking across 
on the back side of it to see as an eye tap. So I would see, and I said, I said to Mark Spitzer and the guys, I said, here, look, you know, you can put a camera in this pretty easily. And finally, they eventually did put a camera in it, and around the time they put the camera in it, they got the attention of Google, and they got bought up by Google, you know, because Google said, okay, that's useful now. Um, so it sort of took industry a while to realize the importance of that, but still, I think they've got it wrong. Um, the, in my 2001 book, I published this theory of glass, the notion of a light space analysis glass and a light space synthesis glass, where light space is the tensor outer product of the planoptic function with itself. So you can read about that in the, in the book. I won't go into it in detail here. But there's a generation one digital welding glass. Generation one glass has the camera as a third eye off to the side. So there's a camera that isn't your eye. It's off to one side of your eye. And that has a lot of problems. Generation one glass, I had a little thing that looked up in there. You look in the exhibit, you can see some of the early generation one glasses, a little glass that's above your field of view and you look up into it. So you can look up information and you keep looking up. And it sort of drove me crazy because I had to look up everything all the time. And it was like, you know, it's really annoying. So, and the camera was off to one side. It wasn't my eye itself. So Gen 1 glass uh, was kind of uh, not very useful. It drove me crazy. It was more of a nuisance than an asset. Certainly didn't help me see better. Gen 2 glass, I made the eye itself be the camera with the beam splitter so the camera's located right inside the eye. And that's what we call the glass eye because it looks like a glass eye. So, so the, or eyeglass or digital eyeglass. Um, Gen 3 glass, I track the focus because you have one eye that's focused in a different distance than the non-tapped eye. Gen 4 glass is infinite depth of focus, laser eye tap. Gen 5 glass is an interesting idea because in Gen 5 glass we take a th true 3D camera and capture the scene in 3D with a time of flight camera. So the meta, for example, the meta view is an example of a Gen 5 glass. And what that means is that it captures everything in true 3D and re-render, you can re-render at PoE. PoE is point of eye. The camera has to be PoE or it'll drive you nuts. This is one thing, the industry seems to be really slow at getting these ideas. It took me 20 years to convince the industry to put a camera in these things, and it's gonna take me another 20 years to convince the industry to, put, to make that camera be PoE. But I think Meta is one company that gets it. Um, uh, because the true 3D camera allows you to re-render it at PoE and therefore get rid of the headache phenomenon, the dizziness, the confusion, the look up, 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 and away, you know, kind of ruin your, your eyes by fluttering up all the time. You put it right in there where you can see it, and it's true 3D PoE. Uh, so, uh, Raymond, do you want to do you want to come up and, and just show briefly? So, Google Glass is a Gen 1 glass, and you can see that chronology in the here, and this is a Gen five glass because it's rendered true PoE. You can switch over there maybe to the... So this is one of the examples you see from the Stevens glass. Um, with this eye glass, is actually a true 3D camera. So you see actually the segmentation real time. We extract hands from the background. Of course, I can push that back to back if I choose to. And I can see the audience here. How are you guys? Uh, at the same time, uh, we can enable some of the real-time tracking of the system. So, light glasses now, you can see, you can track any services in real time. Very simple. And it doesn't matter if it's like a book, it can be paper, because with these kind of 3D technology nowadays, it doesn't matter you didn't need any markers whatsoever for to do the media, uh, media reality system, as Steve suggested. If you guys are interested, uh, we have a proof. Uh, yeah, there's a booth the downstairs. Uh, you can see the booth downstairs. We're in the back corner. Uh, there's a, the Steve Mad booth right next to the Meta booth. Uh, just as a full disclosure, I am a uh, chief scientist of Meta, and Raymond here is is the director of research and development of Meta. Right. So you can see also we can change the field of view of this. As Steve suggested, it's a real 3D camera. So you can zoom, tilt, go left, right. No problems. So having this ability now, we can actually re-render this in exactly how I see. And we have actually samples here, and then we have an actual wearable system allows you to walk around everyday life as a Steve's team uh, with these kind of custom built classes. So anything you want to add? Good. So uh, so anyway, switch back now, I guess. Um, and so uh, and the. Um, you know, you can play in this world right now because the meta, there's a Kickstarter for meta where you can order this 
and actually begin playing with it right away uh, by the end of the summer and develop applications for Gen 5 glass in an augmented reality world. Um, it, the, the whole idea, our, our main vision here is what we call accessibility. Accessibility is the idea of being able to have access to things. And so um, there's an idea of being able to do things and create your own vision and explore, make things that help people see better for ex accessibility and also have access to the technology and so on. So uh, just, it's interesting because uh, this is just a comparison here of, the, of POE. This, is, this glass I'm wearing now is 14 years old. Um, and so this is true POE and not just a, a third eye stuck to the side that isn't the eye itself. So there's some merit in being true POE, as we call it, with an infinite depth of focus, which is this Gen 4 glass on the left. And on the right, we have what's basically a Gen 1 glass. Um, we did, back in 2011, we made a system to help the blind see. We put a 3D uh, camera wearable uh, on a, and we have a, a mind mesh is a, a device that connects, um, I'll just go ahead, I'll skip ahead here. So I'm blindfolded walking down the hallway with this thing, able to navigate and not bump into anyone. <laughs> All right, see if I can go a little faster the other way. And so, and then I run, ran down the hallway quickly. So that it can help people. Here's another thing that we developed is an eye implant, an implantable eye camera that actually goes inside the eye. This is definitely PoE, because it actually is in your eye. In fact, I got the idea because my eye tap makes the camera look like it's in my eye. I thought, well, for blind people, what would happen if they, if, like people who have a missing eye, we thought, well, what would happen if we actually put the camera in there? So we did it. Um, and, uh, and then, um, so there it is, right? There's an example of something that, that we did here. There's a patent that I filed in Canada and then uh, you know, we implemented it. And so the idea is to help people see. Here's another thing I built, which is the wristwatch. It was on the cover of Linux Journal in 2000. Wearable computer on a wristwatch running Linux with an X clock to tell time. It's useless if it, a wristwatch must tell time, so it has to have the X clock. So just some examples. Another example is Interaxon. We, my students started a little company. Uh, James Fung, do you want to stand up? And uh, Chris Emany. You know, my students, some of my students started a, a company to make brainwave technology. It's now a multinational, uh, multi-million dollar corporation that manufactures, you know, brain, actual brain hardware interfaces, devices for brain-computer interface. So if you want to add that to the glass, uh, this is an example. It was featured in the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. This is the product that Interaxon manufactures. And uh, so it's an example of self-monitoring, recording one's own information. When you record your own information, we call that surveillance. Does everybody know what surveillance means? Surveillance is a French word. Sur means above, as in surtax or surcharge. And valence means watching in French. And surveillance means watching from above. So as, a, as police would watch a prisoner or suspect, that's surveillance. If we take the politics out of it, we have valence. Surveillance is the opposite. Surveillance, su means from below, like sous chef. And watching from below is putting the cameras on eye level. Because what freaked people most about this was the camera. So I've addressed that issue directly. And here's just an interesting chronology here. Here's a, this neck worn device that I built back in 1998. This photograph is from 1998 with the neck worn fish eye lens and various sensors in the camera. And then you know, some six years later. So I, sh I showed this to Gordon Bell and presented this at the Microsoft conference and everything. Microsoft came out with this thing called SenseCam, which is similar, and then Momodo now has a smaller version. And basically, it captures your whole life. That's an example of surveillance, inverse surveillance. My six-year-old understands it real clearly. <laughs> she made this nice little drawing to make it I thought, this is good, because this if you can explain it to a layperson audience, they can really, really get it. And then she said, well, no, and it's not quite that. It's really a crowd. Surveillance is the government watching us, or the police watching us. And surveillance is us watching back, and watching them and each other. And so surveillance is crowdsourced valence. And so we have the valence center, 
which is a center for research studies, practice, and invention of valence privacy and privalence technologies. So this is addressing directly the issue of these cameras, because we have cameras all around us and street lights and things like that. In some cities, the street lights all have cameras in them to see how many traffic there are and adjust the lights. We talk about a natural user interface, something in my book in 2001, I coined the term natural user interface. So we talk about natural interfaces and the, the things like the meta, which is a natural engagement using self-gesturing. Uh, we we want to build a center for cyborg environment interaction. Uh, we talk about nature and technology, natural elements. I just wanted to, this is we, something we build, a lot of natural elements and dealing with nature and nanotechnology and things like that, natural user interfaces, nature-based technologies, innate. Um, this is a fun little thing that uh, when I was in kindergarten, my kindergarten teacher said there's three kinds of instruments, strings, percussion, and wind. Strings, percussion, wind. Solid, solid, gas. Strings, solid, percussion, solid, wind, gas. So I thought, oh, that's the three states of matter, solid, solid, and gas. And so I said, is there such a thing as a liquid instrument? And she said, well, don't be crazy, don't be stupid, there's no such thing as a liquid instrument, don't be nuts. So Ryan, you want to come up here and just, because this is like a, a sighting of the Loch Ness Monster. We call her the Loch Ness Monster because she looks like the giant sea snake, and also she doesn't really exist because it's impossible to make an instrument that makes sound from vibrations in water, I'm told. <laughs> so, so this, is, this is an example of a, a completely newly invented instrument. Um, we've uh, performed uh, around the world uh, in uh, Copenhagen, New York, uh, San Francisco. Uh, recently directed a concert, 10,000 people outdoors, um, Ottawa River. And uh, it's, it's a completely new way of making sound, but like Steve's it's very similar to Steve's wearable computing. This is a musical instrument, but with computing like that, you want to have a very close, intimate interaction with this device on your head and a very close feedback loop. With here, you actually have a very intimate feel of the fluid turbulence rushing past your finger. Some people say it sounds like the call of the loon in the wilderness. And you can actually get a very, very subtle control over a musical note with the way your finger moves within it. So this is uh, an example of challenging taxonomies and inventing things that are impossible. So I like to invent things that people tell me are impossible to make and to do different taxonomies. This is what the innards look like. There's a bunch of pipes inside there. And my six-year-old sums it up nicely by saying F equals C over 2 pi times the square root of A over VL when, <laughs> when asked how it works. If you're kind of in the know, that'll make complete sense. And uh, see, so here's what the, you know, it's nice on a beach, you know, in the summertime. And in the winter, we build them in hot tubs. And then this is Beaches Jazz Festival. And then 
we build these things all over the world as for as landmark civic architecture sites. Here's one we built uh, in front of Ontario Science Centre as a landmark architecture site. <laughs> We build them for the blind, Canadian National Institute for the Blind, and they're, they're good for rehabilitation and that sort of thing, and interaction. Water over internet protocol, touch a water jet in Toronto, and it pops up in Australia. We do all kinds of stuff like that. WOIP, new ways of seeing the world, new ways of interfacing, touch water here. Uh, and when you stop water from coming out of one place, it goes somewhere else. So when you stop water from coming out of here, it comes out over there. That's an example of wipe water over internet protocol because those can be anywhere in the world and you can have a water fight with somebody in another country and so we do all these kinds of interactions in the hydraulicos research lab and so uh, this is uh, uh, an example so I just want to say we're collaborating lots of collaborators University of Toronto Interaxon, Ori Inbar, Pete Wassell, great big thanks to you guys for bringing me here. Epson is working with us. Meta, obviously I'm chief scientist and Raymond is director of research and development. And the IEEE ISTAS, is, the IEEE is the world's largest technical society. And so I'm organizing this conference through the IEEE. And uh, this conference will take place June 26th to 29th and the theme is wearable computing and augmented reality in everyday life. So if you want to come to this conference in June, I encourage you to come and see some really interesting things. Bring your bathing suit and try these hydrolophones. We have three separate hydrolophone labs in Toronto. And we've also got all kinds of different interaction and interaction experiences in what I, what I call, the, the term I coined for this is natural user interface. Things that are natural. The meta is an example of an, an NUI. You, you just touch naturally and engage and interact with the real world. The hydrolophone is another example of a natural user interface. It doesn't have to be computerized. It can be completely mechanical with no electrical components in it, or it can be very advanced and computerized. But there's a concept there, a fundamental concept. Um, so glass eyes, AR in everyday life, uh, just summarizing uh, theory of glass, Gen 1, such as Google Glass, Gen 5, such as MetaView, Privalence, Equivalence. Our conference website is valence.me. An interesting spelling of valence that arises from taking the first three letters away from the word surveillance. Take surveillance and cross out the politics and left behind with valence, which is the apolitical, politically neutral term for watching. Not watch, uh, police watching suspects or security guards watching prisoners, but just watching and seeing in general with computer vision. Uh, Pete Wassell and I are working on, a, on bringing a new law into focus, which is a, the law of valence. And um, now we will turn this matter over. I don't know if I have time for a couple of questions or... Uh, no, okay. So I, we now switch over to this face-off, the eyewear AR. I